this is the College of Complexes, everybody. And we are here tonight to hear Ron Batag when he shows up. Uh, tell us about the uh, technologies to solve the U.S. water crisis. So this is our, you hear me? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you um, take the particular pamphlet, Brown Out Science In, um, the figures on that are just minuscule. So on the, um, the arrow there on the left, which refers to um, the uh, annual flow of water, that's 413,000 cubic kilometers a year. And then the one right below that is um, the amount that falls on land is 40,000. And then the, so when you have, see that arrow in the middle where it goes from the flow out of the ocean back into the ocean, the figure that goes back in, the amount that goes back in is 373,000. And then um, I can go through the others. Just, it's just so small you can't, uh, can't read it. But, um, What I wanted to lay out here and just getting started is um, that we're talking about a water, we're talking about a situation in uh, California now, but it's all over the West, it's really all over the world if you look at the amounts of desert. And so in the one larger graph it shows you the dimensions of the, is this cutting in and out? Yeah, it just sounds like it. Feels it'll good. be okay. okay. So the dimensions of the water cycle are basically um, you have what's on the land already that falls um, in the evaporation by the sun, about 10% <coughs> of that makes it. Hey, Jim, can you fix that mic? Uh, a little closer to the mic Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is this all right? Testing? Sorry. It's, it's working. Okay. So the, the key conception, I think, that people have to get is that when you're talking about a water system on Earth, you're talking about a galactic system. It's, it's the dynamic between the uh, ions coming in from the galactic radiation and even beyond, and then the solar operation in terms of the power evaporating. So it's that dynamic as is represented here on these schemas that I want to get into. So it's not just the water that we have presently on land and how do we deal with it, how do we use it better and whatever. It's, um, and it's not just how do we improve that uh, evaporation cycle by getting to desalination. At any one time, I mean during the course of the year, there's a, about 75, as you'll hear in some of the presentation, uh, Mississippi rivers uh, flowing being evaporated and only eight, eight, eight of those rivers fall back on the uh, continent in the course of the year. So obviously it's not a matter of using the water we've got already better. It's, it's a matter of how do you tap that bigger system? How do you get more of the water to fall on earth? How do you use more of that water more efficiently because you get a 2.7 return on if you have it going through vegetation and recycling? Because the water cycle is one cycle. It goes from the evaporation to the certain amount of period on land and then back in the ocean. Ocean to ocean. But the bigger dynamics are what actually affect that, and we're going to get into that and show this, that it's really not the weather that creates the clouds, but it's actually the clouds that create the weather. And um, the third, then, is this question of desalination we'll get into also because there's a a massive jump in the efficiency 
by which we could, on coastal regions, uh, deal with that, and secondly, actually in the cleanup of the water. So to kind of set the stage of this, uh, I'd like to play just a short uh, seven or, I think it's a seven minute clip, kind of puts this in a perspective also politically in terms of how do we change the policy. Okay, which one is it, the uh, cloud mystery one? Uh, that's, yeah, the first one that was. This one right here. Which one? Yeah, the one that was on the, uh, Okay, hang on. Is that it? No, that's a... No, it's actually a... Right here? It was the one that's... Uh, we started, I'll see. The reality is... Yeah. The water exists. The water needed by California, by the other states of the Southwest, exists. The water needed in other parts of the world exists. There's not a shortage of water on this planet. Mankind needs to move into new levels of managing the global water system as a whole. We have the solutions. They need to be developed. We need to create a new presidency that can develop these solutions. But to do that, we have to take out the trash. And that starts with Jerry Brown. We're in a new era. Uh, the idea of your nice little green grass getting lots of water every day, uh, that's going to be a thing of the past. Are the leaders of California so afraid of such incompetent myths that they will tolerate such a blatant policy of depopulation and a disregard for real science and technology? A fraud that immediately threatens the lives of the poorest people of California? and the food supply of the nation? I'm directing all federal facilities in California to take immediate steps to curb their water use. We have to be clear. Uh, a changing climate means that weather-related disasters, like droughts, are potentially going to be costlier, and they're going to be harsher. What, what does all this mean? Unless and until we do more to combat carbon pollution that causes climate change, and everybody, from farmers to industry to residential areas, uh, as well as the entire western region, are going to have to start rethinking how we approach water for decades to come. The time has come to put an end to the wild-eyed depopulation fantasies of Governor Jerry Brown and the rest of the environmentalist Gestapo who claim that in order to solve California's water crisis, they must drastically reduce consumption of fresh water to a limited group of people. That's not a solution for California or the United States. It's a depopulation-inspired agenda, bankrolled by Wall Street, which is in the business of making scarce resources more scarce. The water exists. What's lacking is the policies to develop it, and the recognition that it's mankind's role and obligation to improve these systems. Sorry. Clean water exists for California, for Texas, and for other states in the West. It just needs to be developed. This is not a job for the scientifically illiterate. This crisis is one of the biggest tests for the next U.S. presidency. The California drought typifies the broader economic crisis in the United States. Will the U.S. remain in the grip of the Wall Street-run paradigm of zero growth? Or will we think big and join the emerging new economic order led by China and their BRICS partners? LaRouche Pack has launched a new campaign to solve the water crisis. The future of water for California and for the world depends upon a new understanding of the global water system as driven by solar and galactic processes. Water is not a finite resource. It is not used up and discarded. The Earth's water system is a cyclical process and the entire history of mankind has been tied to the management and improvement of natural water cycles. 
the future of mankind depends upon not only better management of those cycles, but the creation of new water cycles. Did you know that in at least seven different nations, ground-based ionization systems have been successfully used to increase rainfall? Did you know that nations in the Middle East create fresh water from the oceans with desalination systems three to five times larger than anything found in the United States? Did you know that China's South Water North Transfer Project has already surpassed anything that's been done in the United States, delivering more water over a longer distance than any project in the world? And it took them less than 15 years to do so. Ground-based ionization systems can be used to induce atmospheric moisture to fall as rain. On average, 90% of ocean evaporation never reaches the land, simply falling wasted back into the oceans. Ionization systems can be developed along the California coast, allowing mankind to begin to tap the vast moisture reserves of the atmosphere above the Pacific Ocean. California and Texas have some of the largest coastlines of the entire nation, and nuclear-powered desalination can free these coastal regions from a dependence upon unstable precipitation patterns. Two-thirds of California's population <coughs> lives in the coastal regions of Southern California and the San Francisco Bay Area, and all their water use could be provided with desalination using the energy equivalent of one light bulb, 50 watts per person. A water transfer system along the lines of NOAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, can improve the productivity of the continental water cycle as a whole, cycling some of the excess fresh water runoff of the Northwest down throughout the entire southwestern region before it returns to the ocean. These options, taken together, provide a unified program for the development of the water cycle on a completely new level. We have the ability to address all the water needs of California and the Southwest by this higher order management of the ground-based, atmosphere-based, and ocean-based aspects to the North American water cycle as a unified process. But Jerry Brown is telling the people of California, there is no water, so get used to it. Climate change, we will have to radically change the way we live and how we spend our money. Radical change. Are you going to let Jerry Brown continue this murderous fraud? Are you going to let him depopulate the state, starting with the poorest and most vulnerable? Are you going to let him preside over the destruction of California? The solutions exist. Join the LaRouche Pack campaign to make them happen. So, so this is um, this is the challenge that we have before the United States as we go into this next period. Because it, as in reference, not only is this drought situation, California and the West, this is our food supply, this is a problem globally. And it's directly tied to this financial crisis of something like two quadrillion dollars in paper debt that here and around the world is being financed or attempting to be financed first as the system itself is blowing out. Most people realize it was, um, the can was kicked down the road with the Greek situation just to get on Friday, but nothing solved. Nobody's going to pay these bogus debts, and in the United States, we should also, you know, deal with the derivative debt and the swaps that are closing down cities and schools and states here, and we've got a huge fight going on as well, where you have, you know, the Governor Rauner's austerity versus the, you know, uh, Rahm Emanuel austerity, but we're in a situation where we as a people have to, as the water crisis here will go through tonight scientifically, we have to drop the nonsense of budget cutting and backwardness and produce our way out of this thing. 
So as soon as Tim gets back, we can go through some of the, the, the slides. But what I want to actually ground here tonight, quickly enough so we can have a lot of questions, is that scientifically, what was just mentioned, this galactic kind of approach, that what's affecting weather and the change of temperature at any time on Earth is not CO2, is not man driving his car, is not industrialization, but it's this bigger galactic prep process that's actually tied to all these huge cycles, including the effects of um, this kind of weaving through the, the, the galaxy, the plane of the galaxy, which is a 32 million year cycle. So I've got a number of <coughs> slides here that will go through that, but if you look at this, what's fairly now documented, this direct relationship between cloud cover formed by this ionization program, or process, that affects the water vapor forming or not, in terms of first the aerosols and then how it actually sets up. Now people know a little bit about this from historical kind of approaches that we, we used to talk about seeding clouds, where a particular cloud is, is ready to release, or you, you chemically induce it to release the, the water early. Um, this is a step even beyond that where you actually use the dynamics of a known uh, process in the atmosphere to create that situation where you actually form the, um, the aerosols and form the water vapor. And ideally not just to get clouds that are over the earth, the, the continent already have the water to form it and drop it. We want to actually bring more of that water uh, in over the, from, that's not being used, that 90% that falls right back into the ocean. So Tim, if you could put up the first. Uh, which one is that? That's just the uh, the first one there on the list. It's um. I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Low cloud cover and cosmic rays. The one with the from 1980 to 2000. So this is just a graph that um, details exactly that from those you know short period, recent period. If you look at the uh, formation of these, the interaction of these cosmic rays, and then what was the um, the temperature of the cloud formation? You have, you see how close the correlation is. That uh, this is especially a lot of the work of a fellow by the name of um, uh, Svenmark from Sweden and Denmark, uh, especially I think in the 80s. And there's all kinds of YouTube capability of getting to some of this. But what I want to do here is just on the short term, you know, over like a couple of decades, you see the parallel. So the next one is um, is the one that's the um, from the Tibetan Plateau. Now the sun itself, as people know, is a huge globe, especially compared to the Earth. But that sun actually goes through phases pretty much, I think it's every 13 years or so. Even you have its entire polarity shifting. So there's various times the sun is not a steady state operation. It's, it has intense periods, it has less periods. People know about these solar flares. It actually, all these things have reflections on Earth, even in the immediate scale in terms of um, you have a, um, a slow solar flare and then you have effect on even things like hurricanes and others uh, almost directly. But this is a, a cycle that goes from 1,000 years ago to the year 2000 and shows you the kind of um, uh, waning of the, um, of the uh, solar patterns in terms of its density of throwing out uh, rays. Because to the degree the sun creates a magnetic field it blocks this ionization by the galaxy forces. So there's a high solar molecular uh, uh, magnetic field, you have less radiation coming in. If you have it in a weak state, you have more radiation coming in, so you have more cloud cover. So what you have is a direct parallel here over a thousand years of this correlation between that and, um, and, and the temperature, I think it is. Yeah, or precipitation. So the next one which is um, galactic cosmic rays and rainfall. The one on that one. Galactic cosmic rays and clouds, right? No, rainfall. Uh -oh. 
left. There it is. Right there? Okay. Okay. Now, this is actually a period of 7.9 thousand years ago to about 8.3 thousand years ago. And the way they measure these things is, for example, the one on the plateau in, um, in Tibet. You can measure the differences in, in circles and tree rings. In some cases, you measure various kinds of uh, uh, seawater and shell life where you have at different temperatures and different uh, dynamics, you have different uh, cell st structures and, um, and chemical components involved in some of these, uh, these uh, fossils. So this is this kind of period. It's measuring these um, increases in these galactic rays uh, and the, uh, what's the parallel thing? Um, the intensity and the, um, Anyway, it's, it's a, a different correlation, but from a longer period on the same um, interaction between these two systems, the, uh, the control of temperature and cloud cover and the, um, and the galactic rays. And again, this a lot is from, um, you know, this Sven Mark's work and other work over the last, really from the 40s, some of it. So the next one is the, um, the ice rafted debris and cosmic rays. Now, in various kinds of melting of um, glaciers and whatever you have, you know, it, it brings various kinds of debris and different components, and in measuring that also, and this runs from like 12,000 years ago, study of some of these uh, ice deposits and things, uh, up to the present. And again, between the galactic rays, these cosmic rays, and the, the measurement of the changes, what's reflected in the debris, the, the reflection of the temperature at that time, shows a similar kind of correlation. And then the next one is um, galactic cosmic rate flux and temperature, the one you had a while ago. And again, now the, the dotted line is the cosmic rays, and the uh, the temperature over this period from 500 million years ago to the present, and you see a similar kind of parallel with the um, with the changes in these uh, measurements of rays. And I think the next one then is um, this the one that has the uh, the fourth one over on the top, which yeah, which has the galact the our galaxy yeah. Now this cycle of the solar system through the galaxy, the plane of the galaxy itself, as you see, is marked in two different places. It's a 32 million year cycle uh, of these kinds of uh, different amounts of radiation, cosmic radiation, because when you're in the middle of the, the galaxy's uh, plane of the galaxy, or whether you're outside, you have different rates of this uh, ionization uh, hitting you. So through that flux, and these are also the fluxes if you look at um, ice age patterns, if you look at um, the whole life pattern in terms of the species, species going exist uh, and new species at a higher level coming in, this 32 million year cycle, actually a 64 million cycle if you go to peak to peak, uh, is directly related to the same kind of uh, policy uh, or, or practice. You can see, I mean, we can go through more details, and I can give you people a lot to go back and dig this thing out from the um, a couple of articles we have, and there's also YouTube material on this. But what I want to do is maybe finish up with a couple more pieces on this, and then um, just the next one. Let's have to see some of this. So the next one is, um, The cosmic rays are not caught, the double one there. Next one over to the right. Next, next, no, that one, that right there. This is when they actually use various kinds of ionization um, in these aerosols, and it, it tends to dissipate unless it's hit by these ions, 
And when even in lab conditions where they actually hit it with various ions, you stabilize the thing and got them to actually increase not only the aerosols, but then the water vapor around the aerosols to higher, higher levels, and then uh, actually inducing water flow or retarding the water flow, depending on what, what you hit it with. OK, the next one. And this one's um, right here. Okay. Let me know. Uh, yeah, that's all right. No, just tell me which one. Sorry about the trouble. Yeah. What do we go? This one back. Right here, massive clusters. <clears throat> yeah, this is basically what I just said with the their. Um, operations in the lab and they they could actually increase the um, the mass differences and uh, I can go through some more details later but the 18 is basically the uh, the uh, the weight of water but they they direct again this ionization of these aerosols and they could affect the the density of the water what kind of particles are you talking about these aerosols what are they made out of this isn't the question period I'd like to get into some of that a little later, all right? I, what I want to give here is that there is... Okay. Go to the next one. Uh, oh, we just had that. It's the one with the um, three different uh, peaks. Up at the top, I guess it is. Up at the top, no. Right, 30. This is, uh, again, if you, you look on the one side, it's um, the dotted line, again, is the cosmic rays, and the, um, you have three different things, one looking at the aerosol, aerosols, cloud water, and then also the low clouds, but again, showing the, the general pattern and then there's two more I just wanted to touch base on. The next one's with the one with the four. So this is a short-term correlation of temperature in the stratosphere and these secondary cosmic rays. And um, again, we can go through some specifics, but again, you see the, the pattern. The one that's most, okay, one more, I guess. one. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe the one's not there. One of them actually uh, shows that this was well, it's referenced there in the first one we had this direct correlation between uh, the cloud cover or the cosmic rays and temperature. But we can go into that somewhat in questions and I've got some other things we can back it up with. The key thing here is all this notion that somehow what man does on the earth has affected this is bogus. That if you look at these kinds, I mean, these are the systems that actually cause ice ages. These are the systems, if you look at some of the effects on radon and things in terms of this, um, as some of the work has shown, these are the things that kind of build and charge and create you know, volcanoes and earthquakes. These are the, um, so there's a lot of study in this, and especially on this question of the ionization uh, on the water. We, we really have to get some clear studies done. And uh, there's a couple that we go through in a bit, where, for example, in Mexico, um, it was referred to Oman, uh, Australia, in places they actually design these um, systems, they've actually increased even as high as 30 and 40 percent at times. Some places like in Mexico, the water was cut off, I mean the funding was cut off and the program dropped, it dropped back to uh, regular levels. They got the funding back, changed the government, it went back and they actually got the 40 percent and more again. So in terms, and there's a lot of background on this I can give people, 
the, the question here is, are we going to deliver the science that actually begins to, for example, with this ionization, take some of that water that's evaporated over the ocean and falls right back in the ocean, and especially along the coastal areas, and California has a massive coast, induce this to hold its water in terms of dropping the temperature, <clears throat> the pressure, and actually causing some of this to come in over the, uh, the land before it releases its water. These kinds of shifting uh, that, that have already been done in Mexico and other places. Or Australia. And, uh, so the question is one, getting more of that uh, productive capability that already exists that the sun has done the work on. And uh, so we use more and more of the system. What I'd like to do, so we have a lot of time for questions, I want to play one last little seven minute piece which kind of summarizes this and goes into some of the developments and then I can open up for questions as opposed to just talking about it. I think people have to think through, first of all, if these things exist, why aren't we doing it? Secondly, as was referenced a little earlier, that we're in a crisis. We are in a crisis, but it's not caused. We don't have a water crisis. We have a stupidity crisis. And we can actually apply the technologies to deal with this. And the subject of the United States and the world, really, by the fact that we're even on a, a war situation in light of this collapse, we have to actually use this next presidency, create a presidency that starts dealing with this, dealing with the Wall Street problem, dealing with the production problem. But just in building this and building the, the power capabilities to do this, you'll put every city in the nation back to work, like the whole BRICS networks are already doing. And the, we've got three-fourths of the world already moving on that kind of policy and development which is um, the basis of this report that's being used, literally, LaRouche's program all over the year, world with this, um, this BRICS development program we could talk about in the law school. What I'd like to do is in, to think through how do you create the situations to do what you're going to see in this next short film, and then we'll take the rest of the time on questions. And, okay? Okay, I think it's a 14-minute one, right? Yeah, but you can, you can start it a little late, and it cuts off. It's just music and kind of a... Okay, now hang on. I'm going to get a microphone on this. How much water is available in the global water cycle? Yeah. <laughs> 
as an additional precipitation. technology was developed in Russia in the mid-1980s and 
and brought to Mexico, where commercial operations from the late 1990s to 2008 resulted in 5 to 50 percent increases in precipitation in entire states, the filling of reservoirs, and the reduction of forest fires. In Israel, operations from 2011 to 2013 filled seven reservoirs to their full capacity for the first time in the 40-year operation of the reservoirs. A second version of atmospheric ionization technology was developed in Switzerland and was then utilized in the United Arab Emirates. Trials with these systems in Australia from 2007 to 2010 consistently increased precipitation between 10 and 20 percent, and a five-year trial program in Oman starting in 2013 has increased precipitation by 18 percent during the first two years of operation. Let's see how ionization could add to the global water cycle.
Well, we could just leave it there and uh, open for questions, because I think. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we have some areas in the world where there's desertification. There's also areas in the world of massive flooding. Uh, would you propose an opposite system to help those areas where you have massive floods? Or Yeah, we have, I mean, there's... Or if we do keep more water on Earth, will that cause other areas of the world to flood? Well, I think in, in some of these cases, um, Studies are already there and just haven't been done. I mean, they haven't been built. In terms, take the two separately. Um, take the first one first in terms of the desertification. If you look from the Gobi Desert in, in the Asia all the way across through Australia, uh, Saudi Arabia, through the African Sah Sahara, all the way over. If you look at that span, the desert just above the, um, you know, the um, uh, equator. All of which can, if you move into a bigger program like the BRICS and others are moving on this BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, China, India, and South Africa. This alliance that was set up last July, now it has something like uh, 58 nations that have joined in terms of these credit policies. So you start using these kinds of things on a massive scale to impact that. So you can begin, you know, reclaiming a lot of the deserts. Uh, a lot of the, the temperature in the atmosphere that comes off of these deserts causing these kinds of different, um, you know, temperatures in the, uh, the atmosphere. We have these kind of vortexes that form into hurricanes or into uh, smaller operations, tornadoes. Can you actually intervene and break up some of those as they're forming? Can you take as these Tensions are building up in um, in uh, an earthquake situation, and they can actually forecast earthquakes even something to like 30 days in some cases, isolating the epicenter to like uh, 100 uh, miles. So you can actually preempt some of these things at least to move people out. The second half of your question, if we look at some of these patterns, for example, like the monsoon down in in um, in Bangladesh in that area. You, you can't necessarily maybe stop that kind of uh, annual process, but you know, for 40 years since I've been with LaRouche, there's been you know a policy there tied to harnessing the, the Brahmaputra River off the uh, the mountains there, but, but build a huge seawall out there that would actually break up some of the waves. So you might not stop a particular hurricane. But you can break up its, its effects. So you're not wiped out each year. You can build these kinds of things. And the same kind of thing with you know, how do you measure these things and build the dams and the control operations so you're harnessing it, both for the power and for the protection of the population, like the Chinese just did with the Three Gorges Dam. Massive project. It just this, this diversion program up to the north. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, earlier when you when you were talking, you said that uh, you said that global warming is not man-made. So, um, so does does that mean you don't believe in the greenhouse effect? Well, it, it's kind of rough to explain. They're trying to scramble now, but if you actually look at the last 18 years, the temperature hasn't gone up. That's not true. Uh, actually, it has. That's not true. So the the question are these bigger cycles. Zucker? Yes, I want to ask you about your. Louder, Dave. I want to ask you about your Nawapa plan. Uh, first of all, I see that you envision using some of the river water from Canada, and that you also envision using some water from the Pacific Northwest for this. Have you uh, gotten the cooperation from the Canadian, the federal, the provincial, and territorial, and the U.S. state governments for this? Well, this project is actually dated from the '60s. And the Kennedys were for it, the Canadians were for it. It was passed and being moved on in the House and the, in the Senate pretty much. Uh, it was with Jack Kennedy's death that a lot of this got derailed. We've been pushing the same policy since the, um, the, uh, the 70s and the 80s. This has massive benefit for the Canadians um, in that it um, gives them water systems as well. It gives them transportation systems. The, the key thing here is that as it laid out on the, the film, we have two, especially two rivers running north, the Yukon River through Alaska out into the Pacific, 
and then the Mackenzie out into the Arctic. And those two rivers, you have this water flow that a lot of it that hits the Earth, uh, the uh, continent, hits those, runs down the mountains, off these two rivers, right back into the oceans, never was used a second time. All run off. So what Nawapa proposes, this is from the Parsons Eng uh, Engineering Company back in the 60s, they looked at that surplus and the misuse of it compared to the situation down south, and they looked at how do you divert that surplus not all of it, how do you take even 13% or so, before it runs off into the Pacific and the Arctic, house it in reservoirs up there, and bring it down. There's a huge potential reservoir there in the, just across the border and part of the United States called the Rocky Mountain Trench. They think it's 500 miles long, 35 miles wide. You put a huge, you know, Three Gorges <coughs> Dam kind of situation in there, so you channel these kind of reservoirs, bringing it into that, and then with pumping systems, uh, take, you can take it west with no diversion, but you can also bring it over the mountains with a pumping system and irrigate all these areas. You can bring 180 million acre feet of water east and south out of the Rockies. And that project has been sitting on the books, North American Water and Power Alliance, since the 1960s. Now, Jerry Brown's father, Pat Brown, when he was governor of California in the, uh, the time of uh, Kennedy, he built, as governor, most of the water operations that are presently, were up until recently, active in California, including a kind of a leaning toward, as Kennedy was, toward a desalinization program. Now, Jerry has scrapped, I mean, talk about a, you know, a, a baby boomer reaction and uh, in terms of going the total opposite way in terms of zero growth. So we've never built that project. We've been fighting for it since the 70s and 80s. It still exists there now, but you're not going to build this in time now to solve our problem. We have to build it. You can actually, every time you turn this flow over the landmass, you get down to the, the southern areas where you need the water, the capability for vegetation and growth with that water down there is much higher than in the in the Arctic and in the, the north where it's not used, it's just running off. So the question is that diversion, yeah, the, the Canadians were for it. We can actually organize that again. They get massive benefits for it. How, how expensive is that? It'll pay for itself. Oh, yeah, right. Well, just, well, just a multi-trillion dollar government public works project, and it's going to pay for itself. Somebody going to do the work? Pardon mother effing me. Okay. All right. Why don't you just... I will. You remember... Uh, you, you, but just one comment on that. You know, look at FDR in the middle of the de Depression. And what we did with the TVA projects and everything else, we didn't have the money, paid for itself. Or the Eisenhower interstate system. And why are people paying electric bills? If they pay for itself, get, why are get, people paying electric bills? I'll get to that. No, you won't. Okay. Get to it now. Please. Got a little energy there yourself. Hey, I am not the situation. Yes. You are the situation. So you said it'll situation. pay for itself. You said a TV ain't paying for itself. But <laughs> people got to pay electric bills. Okay. If we actually went to this kind of thermonuclear Don't program, take a shot at me. I said we would have to we could actually give electricity away. I'm just kidding. Okay. Okay, Ron, thanks for your presentation. I found your computer stuff very interesting. But your larger scale commercial atmospheric ionization is only a proposal that doesn't exist yet. We've got a variety of proven water saving and water producing technologies right now. Like we've got low flow shower heads, water conserving toilets, modern water pumping windmills, solar photovoltaic water pumping, and so on and so forth. My question is, why don't we use these things throughout California as much as possible in the meantime? Well, everything you've mentioned deals with the water that already exists over the continent, which is a as you saw, a very small percentage. So rather than kind of, how do we, I mean, I've gotten some of the stories out of California in terms of the flushing <coughs> machines and everything else. Rather than how do we minimize everything to get by cheaper, like we're doing with the debt situation, how do we cut, 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 cut to deal with the debt when the elephant in the room is 
that the Wall Street derivative debt is illegal. It's a gambling debt. It's made up. Right, so why don't we just bankrupt it and go to production? On your question... What's that? My question didn't I know, I'm saying, it's just, to do I'm saying as I said earlier, the problem in the water situation, it's not a water crisis, it's a thinking crisis in the United States. So we've got 90% of the atmospheric water falling back into the Pacific, and we have all these amounts we're not using, rather than trying to change a little bit in terms of a, a shower head, why don't we tap a bigger portion of the whole system? Why don't we go to the next technology? It, see, it's a, it's a problem of thinking. When's it going to be? Uh, it's, it's a problem of thinking. Why do we sit? I mean, it's, not, it's all the fields. It's the political field. It's the airport field. Why are we talking about building another airport when we have high-speed rail lines that can take you faster, cheaper on the ground? Build them. Put the nation to work. I agree with that. Because no, oil companies want it. Uh, okay, that's the politics. We can get into that, too. Okay, Andrew. Uh, I have a question. You, you mentioned the, the figure uh, 50 watts per person of electricity needed to produce clean water for the people in California. Why isn't that being done right now if the energy requirements are so little? Because they have a policy against nuclear. They have a policy in the governor of Brown, like it was with the Enron situation, where they um, they jacked the price of electricity right through the ceiling. You know, it's a political looting operation, like with this creation of scarce water. And the the question here is, will the American people sit on their butts while the entire world is moving to this? directed credit system that LaRouche has been laying on for 40 years and this BRICS arrangement, why don't we take up China's offer, join with the BRICS as we scrap Wall Street and go back to our own system and credit and build some of these things. So the, the question on the power, especially with nuclear power desalination, it, I mean, I think it's like two-thirds of the population, if not more, of California lives on the coast in the cities. You were mentioning earlier this problem with pollution. I mean, look at the interior of the United States, a lot of these rivers. The easiest way to clean them up is just drop some desalination plants in there and use them to clean up the rivers, right? The, the question here is how do we get a much bigger system by thinking a little bit bigger? And it's the same thing in the campaign now for presidency. How do we get the, how do we create a presidency that makes these subjects the, the subject matter and force politicians to take that stand? Like on the Glass-Steagall question where O'Malley's now in the race saying item number one is Glass-Steagall, we've got to break this Wall Street control, we've got to build. So there is a means by which we can use the political structure and solve these things, putting the nation to work. And that's what we've got to pull off. That's the subject right now for the United States and the world if we're going to stop this thing from spiraling into a war. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, uh, wasn't it the uh, LaRouches that uh, were going to build a second level on the uh, expressway here in Chicago? I think only the <coughs> Daily had a proposal to uh, build a cross town, I think down Cicero, we supported that. Uh, we didn't have a policy ourselves. I know Sheila Jones ran for mayor, that was part of it, some of the other things, but what do you mean by a second level on the expressway? I, I've never she, heard it. She said they were going to build a second level above the, the uh, uh, Dan Ryan 94, that they were going to build a second level. No. Okay? No, it's a misunderstanding. That turned out to be the most harebrained scheme. That yep, we, never said, we never said that. That's what we said the cross said. town, which was this uh, Cicero line, which we supported. It wasn't even our policy. No, no. It was over 94 when she was No, that doesn't make any sense. That woman was running for mayor. In yeah, but she didn't say that. I was she in the was campaign. I was in the campaign, and she never said that. You remember wrong. I remember that. Yes, uh, Raj Patel. Uh, do, do, you the, uh, do you have political cloud, investment people, uh, engineers, designers who can make it happen and who can make a private proposal? 
and do it this time? I mean, total, total project. Well, this project, which we've been building since 92, no, no, just listen, because the United States does exist on the earth as we presently live on, and we have to be part of that dynamic as opposed to running the protection operation for Wall Street and the speculators as we're presently doing. So we come back to a Lincoln-style greenback policy or a Hamiltonian credit system or what Roosevelt did, we can actually direct the credit into that. Now, there's massive support for that conceptually out here in all kinds of layers, especially with this fellow O'Malley who now announced for president who's taking up this Glass-Steagall question. There are bills in both houses. So there's a growing support. But see, where is the American population? Flat on their butts, watching all this as if it's, um, it's a ball game. They're in the bleachers. There's no political movement in the United States. Sir, sir, so, sir all, due, all due respect to you, my question, my question is this. I, I got a lot of ideas too. But I do not have a capacity to find an investor, find an engineer, find a government people to help me. Okay, whole world's problem is this. Lots of people have ideas that are too far dying. Okay, but people who can make idea happen, they are they are one in a billion. Okay, so you are, what you are talking, what you are talking to talk. You are entertaining the mind okay. and not find, giving me solution or not giving me people who can make it happen. Well, are you familiar with the BRICS? Are you familiar with Modi in India? Yeah, I know, but he has a lot of problems too. I'm not saying people solve. don't have problems. I'm saying since last July, Modi in India, Putin in Russia, Xi Jinping in China, um, South Africa and Brazil, those five nations have formed the BRICS. They have support from Latin America. Greece is in, I mean, Greece, I was thinking Egypt is parallel. But here in March, 58 nations joined the, um, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which sir, is... Sir, sir, do, I'm sorry. I'm asking about America. I'm asking for a specific pro our water problem. I'm, okay. not, I'm not talking about uh, what is happening there or there or there. But it's exactly what's happening here because we are not investing credit into these kinds of projects we are allowing the British-run Federal Reserve to bail out through the Fed these six major banks, and they're crashing. And they may not come out of uh, June and July here with what's now on the table with Greece, because Greece has an option to go with the BRICS. The reality is there's a new system based on the American system, alive in the world, three-fourths of the world's population leadership already moving on it, and it's beginning to get traction in the United States. And to the degree that would get traction, you would end Wall Street and end the British control of Wall Street. And that's what's running the war. That's why they're orchestrating a war. And Obama is in direct confrontation with China, with Russia. And it's a daily knowledge for people. But we think about it wrong. And so we tolerate things from the water to the education system, to the crash, to our own political situation, where we're backing the, the Nazi components in Ukraine, provoking a war that we've got to end immediately. We've got to use the campaign right now, creating a presidency that ends that. And if we don't do that, we're going to get it. Are you selling politics or are you selling water problems? The water project, since we could have built this water project. Didn't sound like that. Okay. Why didn't we build the project 40 years ago? Was that politics or was that just something that happened? We want everything in little Aristotelian boxes so we can think of it by itself, and that's why we're getting beat. I would. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about uh, Wall Street. There was a. It was very quick, but in one of the videos, she talked about Wall Street's plan for depopulation. Doesn't Wall Street rely on growth, and doesn't growth rely on more and more consumers? Wall Street, as an extension of the British Empire, their notion of wealth is basically paper and control of that paper. It has nothing to do with production. In fact, production, like a Roosevelt did, is bad for them because it increases um, supply in the other direction. Shortage is, is things that they can manipulate. So Wall Street is, from the beginning, 
from the slave trade, the drug trade. It's always been a parasite. There is no reason to have a Wall Street. We were built on directed credit as a treasury from Hamilton into building the infrastructure, which then the infrastructure as you build it actually pays for itself in real physical product and the elevation of the population to do that again. The real wealth is that development of people as opposed to money or owning this or owning that. Right. Tim Bolger. Well, how does Wall Street make money by depopulating the planet? We're at a point as the empire faction comes to because their system produces nothing of a crash. So they need a political control, which means right now they got to they have to derail this BRICS policy, which is set up an alternative outside their control. Okay. Tim Bolger. I'd like to know where your stance is number one on the nuclear issue and particularly desalination plants and just a little bit more on weather modification. You said there were some projects already in Mexico and Peru or whatever. Can you please at least give us the names and where to find out more information on them too as well? So it's a three-part question. The nuclear part, uh, desalination, and then the weather modification. And then can you also reference the publication you have there? Okay, what I'm looking at here is a journal, the Executive Intelligence Review. It's a weekly we put out. There's a uh, website. You can just put in EIR and it'll come up. A lot of this is on LaRouche's website. In terms of the nuclear, we're for nuclear. Um, there situations like the questions of waste and all this. Uh, we have recycling programs that take care of 90% of what most people think about as waste. We can use the rest of it as we move into fusion and get plasma torches and things for medical isotopes and everything else. I mean, that's that can be done. Fusion is, a, as people know, one's the splitting of the atoms, the other's a fusing of hydrogen to helium to another level. So we have a lot of material on that. So the fusion especially the question of energy is always a question of energy density. How do you move to a higher and higher level? You can't do things burning wood uh, that you can do with oil and higher technology, especially nuclear and fusion. You have a different energy density in terms of what you can affect. And it just, I can go through more details on that. Mm -hmm. But you know things like the uranium cycle, the thorium cycle, you have all of these kinds of different fuels what you get with fusion is you actually get at a level where like helium-3, an isotope of helium, can become the, the basic fuel. And there's a lot of this on the moon, which is what the Chinese are looking to, to set up mining structures. The interesting thing about thor the helium-3 is that it's polarized. It actually has a charge, so you can actually uh, use it to direct uh, like in a plasma torch or in a propulsion system in a rocket. The, it's not a scattered bombardment. You can actually fuse it because you can polarize it and move it in, in one direction. The, um, the actual cases in, um, in Mexico was uh, areas like Durango, um, that's just the one I had on the map. But um, there are a there were about five different reservoirs, not reservoirs, but areas, counties in Mexico, in which they set up a, sim, uh, a system of these uh, ionization towers, the um, which is basically like a rod that sticks up into the air about a hundred feet, and then you have like four components around it, maybe 30 feet, and you kind of set this charge up. And in these cases, they affected an area, I think in most cases, about 10 miles, but maybe a bit more in some cases later. And you actually created this ionization field, which increased the, first the, um, the aerosols and then the water flow. So they used this to actually increase, I think, the rainfall there 15 to 18 percent. Uh, it's the one I referenced. But they set it up in stages off the coast so that you, you can actually affect the water pressure so that 
if you can use these systems also to lower the pressure so that the actual front comes in over the land as opposed to staying out of the ocean. So you can, you can do these various kinds of things. They've done it in a small area. Obviously, we're talking about a much different situation. So the, the thing we should actually do is get a number of these test cases going. For example, right now in California, there should be an immediate commission set up looking at the crisis. How do we massively use all these techniques in terms of some of the kind of applications you're talking about? But especially, how do we increase the amount of water of this cycle we could use? And just get some bids and things and get some things started as projects and open the thing up. Get some real solutions, like you're saying. We've got these test cases. Let's do it on a bigger scale. Because to wait is not a, um, a solution. Uh, Mike, have you had a question? No, I haven't. I have a two-part question. You should we have three parts? Well, then, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All, we will be All right, so uh, first part is going to be about the stimulus and the $3 trillion we gave to Wall Street. Uh, second part is going to be about why we should be subsidizing people living in a desert where um, I know we get some avocados and tomatoes out of California. So my first question is, do the Lurushis, are they aware that the, the stimulus was trillions of dollars that was given to Wall Street bankers and brokers uh, to stimulate the economy the last six years since the depression of 2008? And it was just a big boon for, uh, for Wall Street. And they got their grimy fingers on the money. Now America owns, we, the taxpayers, own bonds of all these banks. That was the give and take. So we got three trillion dollars of bonds, which Tim will disagree, but I think we nationalized the banks. So we have all these bonds from these Wall Street scumbag banks and brokers, and they got three trillion dollars to play with the last six years. That is, I think, Geithner and Obama's only way to print money to stimulate the economy, since you know we're not in that big of a depression anymore. So are the Lurushis aware of that, one? And then two, why should we worry, be worrying about 100 million people in California and Las Vegas and Arizona living in a desert? I mean, I know we get some uh, tomatoes and avocados out of there. Uh, we could grow that in other parts. But I don't want to you know, worry about these fruits and nuts and flakes people in California. They live in a damn desert. But, you know, what, do you want, what do you expect? There's other places to live. I'm not worried about them. <laughs> right? So why should we be putting taxpayer money into to their that boondoggle state? Well, a couple of things. <laughs> One, um, to start on the, the financial question. We, LaRouche actually put, just to put the, the bailout in a context, if you go back to the crisis in the auto situation, one of the things... Well, I want to leave the autos out of it because they have a different... Uh, but then you don't know why they did the bailout. Well, the autos they bailed out too. And they bailed no, 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 I'm not talking the about the bailout of the auto. I'm, I'm talking, talking about strictly, strictly right. money. Okay. Yes, we were putting 80... With the scumbags on Wall Street. Okay, we were putting $80 billion a month, about a trillion a year, into the bailout of Wall Street as we were suckered into taking over that private gambling debt, and it's still on the books, and that's what's now blowing out. So you can't stay in that game. You will go under, and since they're pressuring Russia and China to back down and play their game, you will get a thermonuclear war. And if you follow some of the things the generals of the United States and other generals are saying, we have to turn that now. We have to get this little psychotic off the button. Now, to go back to the, the debt question, at the time that Congress adopted the bailout policy, whether well, you remember, failed the first time around, and then they beat them up overnight, and then they put it through. At the same time, what was on the political agenda was to put through a Homeowners and Bank Protection Act, freeze that paper, and this passed in like, I think, 18 states, and also on, I think, 65 city councils across the country. Major cities had battles in their city councils supporting this resolution put before Congress by LaRouche. Homeowners and Bank Protection Act that would freeze the whole situation, not only protect the homeowners, keeping them in their houses, 
paying the equivalent, whatever they'd work out through state functions of a rent, which would go into the payment. But if you'd stabilize the situation so you wouldn't have the... Uh, I'm fine with that. Okay. Even people in the house. Okay, I want you to get a couple of things together. People. Otherwise, I, I don't like the money going to okay, Wall Street banks. But to solve, I agree, but to solve it, you have, you have to know who's running it and how they're running it and how do you bankrupt it without going under with it. Well, no, we just printed three trillion dollars. I dollars. agree, but, but unfortunately, you... those guys got it south of Wall Street. But the money printed doesn't mean anything unless it's produced something. The Wall problem Street is they printed money and won't lend it to people. <laughs> but the question, as you see, with the water situation, is you're either going to have water and have food and have development and have a thinking generation coming after us, or we are going to collapse and have that war. There's a reality factor. I don't. I think we could do without California. Personally, I think we don't really need. Right. The question is. Well, question answer. Period. Not, not argument. Period. What's well, that? That's right. No, he didn't answer the uh, second part. You, 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 you have to realize. You could get a chance to, 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 to tell him off in the rebuttal. You have to realize what kind of shirt he's wearing. Right. That explains everything. Yeah. I want to listen. You got three part questions. I only got two. It's just, it's just, <laughs> it's just that, that, like I said, the shirt you're wearing explains everything. I just wanted to know why you should worry about desert people. You know, See, you don't want a lot of It's like the shirt you're wearing explains everything. Let's get to rebuttal, okay. We'll move on to Mike Foley, who has been... All right, Mr. Foley. All right, all right, all right. Let's let's not degenerate completely. All right, let's, Mr. Foley. What's going to be done with it? Well, eventually, it just goes back in the ocean. Well, isn't that brainless to spend trillions of dollars to pump water from Alaska that would go into the ocean for free? Or to pump water from from Alaska to the southwest and then pump it into the ocean? Well, what have we used in the meantime? That's what I asked you. That was my exact question. I said, when all the water gets sent from Alaska to the southwest, what's going to happen to it? And you said it's going to go back into the ocean. I, now you're asking me what's going to happen to it. I asked you. That was the exact effing question I asked you. What's going to happen to it? Now why are you why are you asking me? Uh -oh. Why are you asking me what's going to happen to it? I asked you what's going to happen to it. Okay. So we're going to use it a number of times in the process before it goes back into the ocean. So we'll actually have a human intervention on the water cycle as opposed to saying it just is what it is. Okay. It's going to be used several times, you said. Yeah. For what? For growing things. Ice tea. For drinking, for um, manufacturing, it takes a lot of water in manufacturing. Then why don't you just pump it to California? Yeah. No. Where that's what they need it for right now. Well, that's why where you have pump a... it to the southwest instead of pumping it to California. Well, they both need it. And the... Why not pump it to California? Because they have the coast and some of it could go there. Said, well, they don't have water there now. They're in a drought or something or whatever. They're... Desalination plants is what he's talking about. Okay. Why pump water to the desert? Okay. People that go there, there's nobody living there anyway. <laughs> Most of California that was a desert has now 400 million people, which is no longer a desert. So the, so the, uh, so yeah. So the, the question here is, are we human beings? It's the same question where you let people. Uh, be genocidally cut off. <laughs> look at look at the Nazi situation in the concentration camps where they ground people. Don't start that crap. So it's the same question. It's fascism. Don't people in the southwest have enough water now? Okay, let's move on to rebuttals. <laughs> let's move on to rebuttals. What time is it? It's uh, eight eight eleven. Let's thank our speaker. And just say, um, Tampa. Just, yeah. Go Hawks. Three to two. Let's thank Ron again. Yeah.
to about five minutes, but we'll be a little lenient because of uh, we still have some time. I like what Ron has to say, particularly about the water projects, you know, that might be something to consider. But I do know that the desalination plants can work. They already got a working one out in Tampa, Florida. It does use a lot of electric power. But I'd like to go back to my... Uh, to my uh, thorium power that we had with John Kutz a while back. And you know, one of the benefits of it was industrial process heat that these reactors do. They operate at three times the temperature of a light water reactor, and that can effectively de uh, desalinate seawater through evaporation. And we can run an advanced industrialized society, desalinate our water, and have benefits for the whole population if we would try to get our nuclear power, power stimulated. If you look in this month's issue of Popular Science, they have a number of ways to keep the energy problem, the water problem, and everything else running properly. And it, it, it does, it's a part, does with part of it, is, it involves nuclear. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say it's the end all, the end all, because there are, there are dangers with it solar and wind have a place, and perhaps maybe it is time we reconsider some water projects that might need to be done. We did it with the Roosevelt administration through flood control and other things. We're finding some problems with topsoil and other stuff now, but I'm sure we can manage our way through it. Anyway, thank you, Ron. I know it was a tough presentation and we had a little trouble with the slides and everything, but I'd like to thank him again. At least he's up here and trying to do some things. Basically, from my little perusals uh, this afternoon, I find uh, that uh, desalination <coughs> is either uh, reducing the uh, pressure uh, on uh, a uh, in a closed chamber uh, on the uh, seawater and uh, thereby uh, boiling it, uh, allowing it to boil at a, a low pressure, uh, or uh, reverse osmosis, uh, putting it through uh, filters of, of the uh, chloride and. Uh, uh, sodium uh, that uh, compose the salt, which is 71% of the uh, impurities of uh, seawater, uh, or the uh, electrodialysis. Now, all of these use a, a lot of energy. And uh, the question of how you get that energy is uh, uh, a prime one, and the uh, distribution of that energy. Uh, then there's also the question of the distribution of the water. Uh, it, there, there are, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, atmospheric ionization, uh, the uh, problems uh, of uh, uh, causing uh, the, the water in uh, the atmosphere, the clouds, uh, to uh, rain in one place rather than another, uh, is uh, the, which uh, is, has international uh, as well as regional uh, uh, political uh, kind of implications. So. Uh, I, I think there are a few problems that have to be worked out. I'd like to know more about the uh, uh, a 
agreements, uh, what, what we call the TRIC uh, agreement uh, or conference uh, that uh, apparently is uh, uh, an association of some uh, nation, national groups. Uh, I know that desalinization can be and is being used not only in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the Arabian uh, coastal states, uh, but uh, in, in many other places, uh, in, uh, even in Mexico. Uh, and well, I, I just uh, hope that uh, we will be in on that. And when it comes to water transfer, uh, from uh, other regions, uh, the, I don't know how well the uh, agreements uh, with the Canadians in the 1960s will stand up against the use of water on uh, shale oil in uh, what uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba. Uh, the, the Canadians want to export that, uh, and they were. Uh, I'm probably uh, going to be using, you need a lot of water to, to uh, refine or to uh, extract that uh, oil. So I see a few political complications. Yeah, and Our next speaker, Rebuffer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My fellow Americans. I uh, would like to uh, be able to talk without being heckled. Is that all right with you? No. Uh, no. Mr. Richie. Uh, I'm, okay just, with yeah, you? I'm just teasing you. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I, I don't I'll tease them. you. I normally, don't, I normally don't heckle. Okay, but. well, can we not he's, do it this time? He's playing the role of Charlie. Sorry, baby. Uh, this presentation has caused me to come to a very important decision in my life. I've decided to move to the Tibetan Plateau. I, uh, I figure water, the, the water problem will be completely corrected for me because I'll be able to get all the water I want from the Himalayas, uh, from uh, Hansa land, and not only that, I'm going to start bottling the water and shipping it to the U.S. So that'll be my contribution to the water problem in the U.S. And Hansa land, for your information, is where people live to be 160 years old, so I can sell the water on the basis of that it's good for your health. In the meantime, I'll uh, trade <coughs> I'll bring a bunch of trinkets with me and I'll trade to the Bedouin trade uh, uh, caravans and I will um, sell to one trade caravan and buy from another trade caravan and I'll be able to live on the Tibetan uh, plateau for the rest of my life and just think of it. No more income tax, no IRS, no state income tax, no red light cameras, no photo enforcement cameras, and I'll be on the Tibetan plateau. Under the control of the red Chinese communist government. I thought we agreed that there weren't going to be any hecklers. I was just stating that. You being behaving that way, especially when you're supposed to be a capitalist and have respect for other people talking. So therefore, I'm going to the Tibetan Plateau, and I'm going to live happily ever after. And all of you people, if you want to buy my water, see me after the thing, and I will uh, let you sign up. I'm going to sell subscriptions to it. <laughs> Along with the censored internet. What would you say? Along with the censored internet. Okay, Ron, again, thanks for coming. 
World Water Day was March 22nd. Earth Day was April 22nd. World Environment Day was yesterday, June 5th. This year's theme for World Environment Day is One World, Our Environment. Uh, these are the ideal times to emphasize doing better with our current water resources by using practical, sustainable solutions and to give us hope for our continued survival. Let's broaden our perspective by covering both the national and international aspects of our water crisis. I was an environmental energy conservation activist in Council Bluffs, Iowa before I moved to the Chicago metropolitan area in February of 1982. At a small electric utility meeting with Iowa Power and Light present, I said that water was going to be our next environmental crisis. Well, here we are in 2015 dealing with a water crisis and an energy climate crisis. Folks, they are both interconnected. The LaRouche so-called plan to solve our water resource problem is just as much a bad anti-ecological fantasy as their so-called plan to solve our energy problem by using controlled thermonuclear fusion, quote, always 30 to 40 years away, unquote, and too dangerous, too expensive nuclear fission fast breeder reactors to supply a world population of 40 billion people. None of the LaRouche proposed technocratic tunnel vision so-called water solutions will provide immediate or shorter term and substantial relief to drought stricken California or any other water thirsty regions as well. There are three issues with our water crisis that must be dealt with simultaneously. Water quantity, water quality, and water control. Nuclear power desalination is not a solution for regions that are poor, located deeper in the interior of a continent, or at a higher elevation. This includes some of the places that have the biggest water problems. We can have renewable power desalination using solar and wind. Increased water conservation and greater water efficiency remain the most cost-effective priorities in areas of the world where there is a large potential to improve the effectiveness of water use practices. Wastewater recovery for irrigation and industrial use provides multiple benefits over nuclear power desalination. Urban runoff and stormwater capture also provide benefits in treating, restoring, and recharging groundwater supplies. A proposed nuclear power desalination plant using a 10 megawatt reactor will have cooling water polluted by radioactive tritium, quote, heavy water, unquote, which could enter the marine food web and contaminate fishes, sea turtles, and marine mammals. It is also doubtful that a single purpose nuclear powered desalination plant will ever be economical. Well, let's assume that a nuclear reactor was used to generate electricity, and then the waste heat from this power generation was used to desalinate seawater, as what Tim mentioned. Nuclear cogeneration, so to speak, which I still oppose. You still would have the serious unresolved problems such as weapons proliferation, radioactive waste, and terrorist attack that plague commercial nuclear power. The number one overall threat to our global water supplies is human-made climate disruption. To effectively deal with our energy climate crisis, we should be rapidly implementing a total reliance upon technically and economically feasible non-fossil fuel and non-nuclear energy strategies based on energy efficiency, non-nuclear cogeneration, and appropriate renewables by 2050. We need a more watershed secure and water just world with more progressive water resource management. This should maintain fairer and more equitable access to cleaner water supplies. It is imperative that the bad trend toward water privatization be resisted. Transferring the control and management of our water resources from public ownership to private ownership is the worst scenario for ecosystem protection and creates even greater societal inequalities. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. EPA, recently released its Clean Water Rule. This will restore the protections under the Federal Clean Water Act to 60% of our streams and wetlands that form the foundation of our nation's water resources, supplying the drinking water for 117 million Americans. I submitted comments to the U.S. EPA advocating a strengthened clean water rule. During the past several weeks, I sent messages to President Barack Obama and our two U.S. Senators, Dick 
Durbin and Mark Kirk, encouraging them to stand up to the large polluters and their congressional allies who want to weaken the clean water rule. Uh, thanks a lot. I think my previous speaker did a very good job in explaining the whole problem. And uh, I thank you, the speaker, for bringing the idea. And uh, problems are real, solutions may be. Okay. The, I'm, I like American capitalist system. And uh, mainly I like it because it has work. It's not perfect. Wall Street sucks, government sucks, okay, and uh, lots of problems. But, bottom line is this, it has work. We have technology that improves our life. I mean, that is fact. But the technology has to be created by the engineers and, entrep and entrepreneurs should be convinced that that is good. Investors has to be convinced that that is viable. Texas, they had a drought for three, four years. There was so much rain now there. If you if you build a big Taj Mahal there, you know, and spend hundred billion dollars, and there is too much rain, what do you do? It's just like few years, few years back, we were talking about uh, alternative energy. It's still good, but it's not a that way we were talking about because lots of companies lost lots of money, lots of industry, lots of money because technology wasn't mature. Okay, so I agree that our problem is there, but I think solution will be coming. I believe California will get water from sea and uh, desalinate it, you know, what is most efficient way, probably solar, solar way, you know. But they can do, I do not know enough about those things, I'm not going to talk. But, but that, and government uh, is a problem to convince government, but you, you have to have those abilities. If you don't have those abilities, that's a big problem. Okay, if you cannot handle the government, and if you cannot come in, you know, senator and president and and other scientific people in the government, you cannot do it. Okay, one other thing which is entirely different, different, different. Uh, our Pope uh, in uh, Washington, uh, in uh, Italy, uh, very, 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 very important, very, very important thing, and which I believe that that's the right way on evangelization. And give me one example what happened. In, in Israel, in Knesset, one member of parliament, he was sitting on a chair and ripping up Bible and throwing on the floor. Okay? What was the, and, and, and a reporter was taking a video to put on internet. Now, what was the problem? I mean, here are other things to do. Problem was that these evangelist uh, people, they are like a paste flooding every day, then mess it. Hey, come on, guys, leave them alone. They are, that's a government office. You don't have to go everywhere. Now Pope says, okay, the good kind of evangelization is wrong. Proselytizing and evangelization is a complicated subject. And most people who sell Jesus and sense people, they do not know what they are talking about. They have a no understanding. They do not practice any of the teaching of the Bible, <coughs> but they go. And I, I thank very much that a Pope has a, given his definite opinion and definite directions, and I appreciate that particular act of Pope. Thank you. My name is uh, Li Ping Yuan. Uh, thank you for the speaker. I learned something about uh, this uh, ionization uh, to produce water. That's, uh, uh, I should know more. I should uh, study a little bit more. Uh, one thing about the uh, seawater desalination, I would like to separate from separate that from uh, nuclear energy because uh, it's just need energy to desalinate. And uh, we can get the energy from wind farm or those uh, in the coast, coastal area, the wind is usually very strong. So we can get the energy from that. 
separate that from the nuclear energy, which is uh, still arguable, uh, lots of uh, its own problem. If nuclear energy, if you are a proponent of nuclear energy, it's just an energy, it can be used at anything else. Nothing, I don't see any particularly a relationship between the two. But, uh, okay, uh, that's one thing. Uh, more, more important, uh, I would like to say something about my experience when I was in Canada about 15, 20 years ago. I was there for 10 years. And uh, in Canada, the Canadian did uh, talk about the water situation, I think uh, maybe related to this uh, North American Water and, uh, and uh, the Power Alliance. Uh, but they are pretty much determined, at least at that time, they said no, no, no. Their experience is from the Great Lake. They think they should uh, share half of the Great Lake uh, resources, but uh, certainly the U.S. has much more uh, population around the Great Lakes and the Canada, so I think U.S. is using much more uh, Great Lake water than uh, Canada, so they, they feel uneven there. And also, the, in terms of uh, Western Coast, uh, there are lots of water in British Columbia, Yukon, and the Northwest Territory, there's no problem, but uh, their, their point uh, was say, you can bottle the water, okay, that's not a problem. But uh, some U.S. company wants to use an uh, oil tank to carry a tank of fresh water from British Columbia to California. Canadians say, no, don't even think about build a, a pipeline or water canal or something like that. Just the, the water tank is not allowed. So I think uh, U.S. have to do a lot of work to talk to Canadians to, to, to make the deal. And uh, if you think, uh, if you think uh, Canada is uh, very unfriendly, maybe you can look at uh, how, how Mexicans look at us uh, when we cut off the Colorado River and uh, then use all the river water. I don't know how much water still goes to Mexico. Probably nothing nowadays. So, uh, something about the, to think about. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have just been informed by Susan uh, that, that, uh, that the score in, in game two of the Stanley Cup Finals is now tied three. All right. um, for those of you who haven't been following, the, the Chicago Blackhawks are in the Stanley Cup Finals and they're playing against uh, Tampa Bay. Now, um, I was really interested in the topic tonight um, about desalination. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I don't. I haven't done enough research into this topic. Uh, I know that both Dennis and Rob made some very um, uh, you know, interest, interesting critique of it. I, I don't. I don't know enough to make a judgment. However, I was quite. I was rather disappointed that our speak. You know, when that our speaker turns out to be a global warming denier, and this tells me that if if the if Larouche Pack, uh, if Larouche Pack is is either denying the existence of global warming or claiming or or, or claiming that it's happening but it's not man-made, then if you don't understand the problem, how the heck are you going to solve it? Now. Um, I asked our speaker tonight if, if, because, um, because he was talking about the temperature increase being ca caused by cosmic rays, um, which is a theory I've heard before. Yeah. Um, and I asked our speaker tonight if, if he denied the existence of the greenhouse effect. And in fact, he went one better. He actually denied global warming by by claiming that that the Earth had that the temperatures have not been going up over the last 18 years. Well, that's not true. Um, I just. I just went to um, actually I just went to Noah here while I was waiting to speak. Uh, temperatures actually not only has the has global warming been continuing over the last 15 uh, 15 years, it actually has accelerated according to the National Oceanic 
and atmospheric agency. Um, now, so uh, I also noticed that, um, so the temperature, the average temperature uh, worldwide is going up in spite of what the speaker says. Now our speaker, uh, now uh, again our speaker attributed this to cosmic rays rather than to ca um, carbon dioxide. Now for those of you who are unfamiliar with the greenhouse effect, the, the greenhouse effect is, is that carbon dioxide uh, will, contains heat more effectively than just pure oxygen. Uh, and so the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, uh, the more heat is retained in, in the atmosphere. Or it can be an atmosphere, like the inside of a building, for example. Um, now, this is not some, it's not some unproven theory. This is, this is a fact. This can be proven in a laboratory setting. So, um, and, but my, our speaker tonight did not answer my question about, the, about whether, he not, whether or not he believes in the greenhouse effect. Um, which is really not a matter of belief, like, like believing in God or uh, heaven or whatever. Now, I, I just wanted also to say something about the, the college itself tonight. I was rather disappointed in the behavior of a lot of the people here tonight. I want to say that the, uh, the question and answer session is a time for questions, not for arguments. If you start getting into a, a never-ending argument with, with the speaker, and I saw more than one person do that tonight, it, uh, you're, you're taking up too much time, it isn't fair to other people who have questions, and it isn't fair uh, also in terms of the rebuttal time because you're taking away from, from the time for rebuttal speeches. Now, I, uh, I see Dave Travis isn't here, and I just I, I want to also just say that I, I completely agree with Dave that heckling is wrong, and, and, and I wish he was here because I would want to uh, just tell him that uh, the only reason I spoke to him up here is because he asked questions of the whole audience, and I couldn't resist replying. No, no, Dave, Dave's a good guy. I just, I just like to. Um, all right, now, but Dave did say something I would uh, that, that I'm not sure I'd agree with. He said capitalism is about respecting others. He's talking to you, Tim, and and well, I used to be a I used to be a car salesman, which you know, and many would say that's capitalism at its finest. And uh, and and at the place, and I'm not gonna. First of all, I want to make it clear that I do not believe that all car salesmen are crooked. Okay, I just want to make that clear. All right. I personally, I personally tried to be honest. Um, at the particular car dealer where I worked, uh, the system was, the the the, 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 the the mathematics they used were kind of designed to fool the customers. So it seems to me there are a lot of cap, and I'm not, I'm not against capitalism per se, but I'm not so sure that capitalism is all about respecting people. I think that's more of what ethics is about. And I think that a lot of, because I think there are a lot of people who consider themselves capitalists who feel, who feel that, um, that they got a right to put one over on, on, uh, on their neighbor. Um, so uh, again, I just want to say that I do not believe that all car dealers are crooked, okay? So that's all. The one interesting idea that our speaker touched on tonight, desalinate, oh, desalinate. that's something that California, regardless of what method they use for that, is something that should have been done years ago. Uh, it would have cost less if they had done this 20 or 30 years ago. And if the drought ended tomorrow in California, they should still build desalination, desalination plants, because that would free them from the need to have to depend on snowpack for water. And instead, they could use the snowpack water as a backup and have a more regular and a more dependable source of water uh, if they went to desalination. However, California needs to face some uncomfortable facts. They cannot forever continue, there have to be limits to growth. There cannot forever be people, millions of people packed into places like LA, San Diego, and Palm Springs. They are packing more people into a desert than it was ever meant to support. And that has to come to a stop. <laughs> they have to realize, as I said, that there have to be limits to growth. Plus, California has a bad record where the stealing of other people's water is concerned. They stole water in the Owens Valley from the farmers who needed it for crops and livestock. They nearly got into a war with the state of Arizona on um, 
who was going to get the, what water from the Colorado River, that eventually had to be decided by the Supreme Court of the United States. And I might add that the Chief Justice at, at that time, Earl Warren, having been governor of California, recused himself from any participation in the case. Finally, I would have liked to have heard Dennis and some of the other environmental speakers here tonight talk about the fact that the building of dams is not always a good resolution to water problems. That it causes disruption in the landscape, that it can vary as the Three Gorges Dam did priceless archaeological sites, and it disrupts often the lives of people who live in the towns and villages in the area where the dam is going to be built. And so I would like to have heard a little more about that. Particularly when you consider that in the 50s, a big fight started over the building of the Glen Canyon Dam, which gave rise to the huge reservoir at Lake Powell. Except it's not so huge now. It shrunk down to a tiny size. And in fact, you can walk into the parts of the river, or what once was the, the river bottom that the Glen Canyon Dam was holding back. So, as I said, dam building is not always a, a good solution. Thank you. I'd like to start with my friend Don Ritchie. You know, uh, Don, I like you. Uh, I didn't know you were a car salesman, but uh, that doesn't mean I like you less. But you know something? I, I, in 77 years of life, I have found uh, more honest car salesmen than I have found honest priests, honest doctors, and honest intellectuals. Oh my God. Especially the intellectuals. They are intellectual charlatans and ideological mercenaries. That hurts. Oh. Hey, Senator, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> this, is, this guy should be a senator. He shouldn't be wasting his time out here. <laughs> Us common people, he should be, I want, him to, I want to see Tim in Washington. I told him, I'll wake his preaching. I don't care if he's a Republican and I'm a left-wing Democrat. <laughs> But this gentleman here, I'm sorry I didn't hear the esteemed speaker. You know, I grew up in the country uh, first eight years of my life, which is surrounded by water all around. But the problem is I never remember taking a bath. You know, we would live in the mountains. We're the hillbillies, like Appalachian part of Greece. So I come to America, I got my first bath, also my first pair of shoes. But then I went on grammar school, high school, college, law school, and I've been living happily ever after. I take one shower every day. But the thing is, with the water, uh, you're going to find the most truth among the people who are right of conservative and left of liberal. Me, I'm far left of liberal. I think our speaker here is, I regret that I didn't come in time to hear him. He's from the Rouge. I've got a couple of friends who I met up in Lincoln Square here. And boy, I trust those guys more than I trust the socialists or the communists. Those guys, uh, I've learned a lot. You know, they give me the newsletter and all that, the Russia's writings. I've learned a lot. So I respect them. And uh, I don't know if they respect though the idea that certain things should be free. And this is where I want to finish. Uh, water should not be a business. You, you know, when you buy a plastic bottle of water, it costs 3,000 times more than the water from the tap. I never drink water from the bottle because I don't want the rich bloodsuckers making three thousand dollars profit with stale water. I drink fresh water from the sink, not from the faucet. My father, he lived right over here, Foster and uh, Kimball. He, he lived to be 90 years old and all he drank was Chicago water with fluoride, with urine, with whatever is in it. I don't know, before they clean it. But in any event, it's good water. I drink two, three gallons of Chicago water every day. I love water. And uh, nothing happened to me. I don't even take one aspirin a month. And I'm 77 years old. So Chicago water did never hurt me or my dad who lived to be 90 in perfect health. So first of all, though, education should be totally free. You should not have to pay for an education. Who said so? The Bolsheviks. Number two. Medical care should be totally free. Who said so? The Bolsheviks. Religion should not be a business where guys like 
uh, Billy Graham can become multi-millionaires. Nobody should be able to make money off a religion, priests or ministers, to work one day a week and to have all the money that they need, plus even make millions. So that is the other thing. And uh, the thing about water, it should be like air. There's all kinds of water everywhere. A lot of this is uh, propaganda. You know why? Because I read some uh, word in a newspaper, I think, that they're going to make different grades of water. You'll be paying, let's say, a dollar a gallon for water you drink from the sink. You will be paying 50 cents a gallon for water you, you, you have in the toilet, to you flush the toilet, and you want to pay 5 cents a gallon for water that you wash your car and stuff like that. They, they're going to have grades of water. So in other words, they're building us up, and the first thing they did to brainwash the people is with the those stale old water that they put in those plastic bottles. So water should be free. You should not have to pay one dollar or one penny for water. That should be what our taxes are for. But our taxes go to enrich the rich people. And the most biggest crook that I ever read about in the mass media, and I'm finishing with him, remember this guy, David Brooks. David Brooks, not the famous David Brooks, but the infamous David Brooks. This guy, he's a New York war profiteer for his daughter's birthday, 12 or 13 years old. He spent $10 million for her birthday. Now that guy never had to work one day for that million dollars. You and I, all of us, work for him to have that $10 million to spend on his birthday. That's our money that he's enjoying. And he, if he can spend $10 million for his birthday, imagine what other uh, luxuries we afford those bloodsuckers. So that's the first thing. Abolish uh, the last thing. Abolish the Defense Department. In 200 years, America never fought a defensive war. America never knew how to fight a defensive war because they never had to fight one. The only wars America fights are wars of aggression. And they're still opening new. In Africa, Obama's opening 20 military fronts the last two years. It was in the Financial Times. So this is what we got to abolish. Abolish the Pentagon, give everybody free water, free college education, free medical care. care. It's our money. It should not belong to these bloodsuckers like this SOB, David Brooks, the war profiteer. Hello, hi, my name is Ellen, and um, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, first of all, Tim, I know you mentioned something about thorium, and um, we had a speaker several weeks ago, um, a debate between um, Dennis and, and the thorium guy. I don't remember his name. John Kutch. What was his name? John Kutch. John Kutch. Thorium guy um, do. Okay, now, this, the speaker, John Kutch, he made it seem like, you know, you were either for thorium or you were for renewable energy and you really couldn't be for both um, and, and then he brought up a lot of exploitation going on of workers in China um, about thorium uh, you know um, or not about thorium about uh, renewable energy um, in order to get the proper minerals for it um, but you know one I was um, recently speaking to my brother-in-law who's a physicist and he was saying that the regulatory hurdles for a new thorium power plant are just enormous. Um, and it could take like 20 years to develop a proper thorium nuclear power plant. Um, now, so, so that, that's a serious problem. Like, you know, you could test some various chemicals and how they react in containers, and you could, you know, you could start it, and you could, it could take several years just for certain processes to determine whether they're safe or not. I mean, and, and the guy who spoke about thorium also said that there was some kind of thorium power plant or something in the works, but they had to cancel it due to, um, you know, dangerous, uh, situation going on um, 
you know, um, with a power plant. Um, so um, while I'm not 100% opposed to um, thorium, people are trying to learn more about it and see whether it might be able to be used, you know, this idea that it's just going to solve all our problems, I mean, it's going to take an enormous amount of time and resources to get one up and running. And, and this idea that it's one or the other, oh, we'll just forgo um, renewable energy in order to pursue thorium, I mean, that's, that's insane. Um, my brother-in-law also thought it, thought it was crazy that we were fighting wars for oil in the Middle East as opposed to, you know, going ahead and pushing for renewable energy. Um, and this is a physicist, so I think he's more um, versed and knowledgeable about this subject than probably anybody who goes to the college. Um, okay, um, so that, that was one thing I wanted to say. Um, then the, the other thing um, I just wanted to mention was I'm not sure if people know um, about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yes. Um, agreement yes. that um, the, the White House is pushing. <clears throat> um, I was kind of surprised when I was talking to people that so few people knew about it. Um, it would be a major trade agreement, but um, I think there's like 29 provisions or sections in it, and only about five have to do with trade. Um, so there's a lot, lot of stuff which is very concerning um, about the uh, potential agreement. Um, things that really, um, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, th things that that, do, that kind of um, would take away our sovereignty as a nation. So that's a major concern, and there's a lot of environmental concerns. Um, there's environmental concerns, and there's um, labor concerns. So I think um, it, it could have some very bad potential um, results. Um, even, you know, there are mainstream people like Paul Krugman is against it. Um, there's people who I don't like, um, like that guy who uh, Obama had in charge of the... Um, the economic stuff. Geithner? No, not him, but the other one um, from from the Bush administration. Carried on. Summers. Summers. Larry Summers, I think, is opposed to it. So I mean, even main, you know, some mainstream people. I'm not equating those two people together, but are are opposed to it. Um, and they want to put it. The a White House wants to put it on a fast track. Um, so maybe that um, so that it'll get approved quicker and easier, maybe without filibustering. Um, so that, that's very serious. Um, it could have some really bad consequences. Um, Democracy Now! has been doing some um, exposés about it and talking about it and, and its dangers. And I would encourage everyone to um, read about it and learn about it um, and say no at least to the fast track so that um, it, a proper debate can be done about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, you get the oh, last one. secret. I forgot to mention that. It's secret. Okay. Oh, yes. And uh, TTP is secret, so we don't really even know what's in it, which is very unusual for a trade agreement. Okay, okay I'm going to take a few minutes just to... Focus. Um, the point I started with and I'd like to leave is that these galactic processes are really the biggest determinant on the Earth with the interface with the Sun. So the weather patterns, we went through that. If people want sources on this, uh, I can give them links to get to this. One of the questions, if you look at this dynamics, if you look at just what's brought up, the political dynamics as well, there's a lot going on which we're not measuring. Whether you're looking at the financial situation controlled by the derivative debt and the TPP is basically that. They're attempting to use this to crush China, crush Russia, crush this BRICS process, keep it in a check as the whole thing is coming down. It can't work. It cannot be bailed out. It's coming to a head. And that's also the feeder on the, the war drive. And so we don't like this about you know Obama, we don't like that about Obama, some people like this or that. Obama is a pick puppet following on the Bush operation running the same policies. The uniqueness about Obama is he's a narcissist. 
and there's nothing going on in his head of his own, you know, grandiosity. So he's the easiest person to use in these war situations, like in Ukraine that was created by the West, the expansion of NATO, like in the Middle East, like on the surrounding of China. And they're running a confrontation on the bluff. They either get it back down, or they can actually win a thermonuclear confrontation, catching second strike on the ground. Now this is what's going on right now. There's generals talking about everywhere. Now what's interesting about this water project, like Roosevelt in the 30s, you need something that can lift the United States back to its principles with the credit system putting it to work, get this water project started. We don't have to test nuclear power, it's already proven. You can do mass production of these by retooling some of the auto plants and build out of this thing. Get the nation, drop projects into these cities, begin training the young people moving forward. The water project here in the California situation is an immediate necessity that you can sell as a package for this new approach for the presidency. What's interesting about this fellow O'Malley is the only candidate running that has stepped outside that Wall Street control. They call him the, the most hated man on Wall Street. Why? Because he's going directly at this question of Glass-Steagall. What? the bankruptcy on Wall Street, isolate this paper and be in a credit system like most of the world is already moving on. We can come back to an American system. So we can build these things and actually solve this. This is what I was saying earlier, LaRouche was laying out since the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act. We could have gone that route, they blocked it, and Congress put through the, the bailout instead. It, but if you think about it, like with the TPP, like with the, the bailout, they were all defeated the first time around. Massive thuggery from behind the scenes to change that. Now what we've got to have is a mass movement of the population building a presidency that sticks and makes this the issue. And so we can pull it together. People wonder whether they can change anything. We're in a situation in the crisis to do what a Roosevelt did, do what a Lincoln did get a percentage of the population in behind a solution, financing this with a Hamiltonian program, and build your way out of this. You've got to remove Obama from the White House because you've got this war situation, and you're never going to get any of these policies. But whether you look at the Bush family or whether you look at Obama, it's really the same policy. So the question here, and I'd like to give people the, the you know, LaRouche uh, side in this, I can give you the links to the, the background on this. This guy's uh, uh, Senmark. It's like a hour program on the organization. We have web access now, so go ahead and give me the... the, the uh -huh. If you want to, I can, I can pull up the links. I got web okay, access. Okay, I, I can do that a little later. But with the question I want to leave here is you think of this galactic, these bigger processes, including humanity itself. The United States is the first formation of a nation independent of that empire faction with a credit system of Hamilton that allowed us to build. We won the war, we almost lost the nation anyway. But if we come back to this credit policy of Hamilton, if we move in that form across the nation with these infrastructure projects, especially with this water project, you can actually begin training the next workforce and actually build out of this thing. But that is the political subject. It's not what candidate do you pick. It's how do you build a movement and a presidency which you then fill. And right now, of all the gaggle running on the Democrat side, you know, Hillary already with, you know, Benghazi and all this. I mean, the fact that she's even considered by thinking Americans as a candidate should be, you know, scrapped. Same on the Republican side. There is not a content, you know, an idea being put out. This question of Glass Steagall. Just in the last period, you have, you know, the revelations on Benghazi, where they actually have proved publicly with the, the Defense Intelligence AG material that Obama lied. Same thing on the Osama bin Laden operation. You can go through point by point by point, but it's not Obama as Obama. It's Obama as the puppet of this bigger operation. So, if we shift now to an American system of credit. If we as the United States take up these challenges and build a future, create the 
addition. Don't go backwards. And one of the things, like a couple of things came up on the in, environmentalism and, and this. I mean, rather than having this just being opinion, people can think it through themselves. Take something like carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is part of a cycle that we know in the biosphere. Plants give off oxygen. They live on carbon dioxide. We exhale carbon dioxide, we breathe in oxygen, the mammals. So you have this dynamic. So if you want to deal with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and on the earth, plant more trees. No, they're cutting them down. I, I didn't say what they're doing. I said what we have to do. So we've got to get beyond pointing to what is wrong and what other people are doing, and they're doing this and they have the power to do that. We have to actually stop ourselves and as the United States say, looking 50 years down the road, looking 100 years down the road, looking right now, what has to be done? What do we have to do and get it done? And that defines the politics. And that defines who we're going to allow to be a candidate. You see, we've, we've sold that out. We've got all kinds of excuses why we were okay in doing that. But we're now at a point with the crisis we face, with the war situation, we have to do this, not by November's election, but right now. Now we have an advantage in that because this BRICS arrangement since last July, we have close to three-fourths of the world, half the world's population's leadership in the BRICS and other nations with that. Three-fourths of the world's population moving on this economic policy of credit as infrastructure and development and science. And that, you can actually trace it out over the last 40 years, is LaRouche's International Development Bank, which went on the table politically before the world in 75 and 76. And it's being actualized. And the fact that there's doublings of the Suez Canal and the Nicaraguan Canal going up and all these things, and it's not in the U.S. press. It's not in the politics. It's not in any of these people's rhetoric. And we've got to put it there. So I'll leave it at that. We have to actually define the political situation. And so to come back to this particular water project, getting to these higher levels where we can tap more of this water cycle and actually go to the next scientific phase. So I, um, the LaRouche's site is LaRouchePack.com, and this Executive Intelligence Review magazine, it's a weekly, it's on, online as well. I can take people's name and number, I can give them the links to these various things. But I think what's got to come out of this is we've got to break this routine of thinking about things like we always thought about it before. Because the one thing about the universe and the one thing about mankind and the biosphere, it's developing. It's developing to higher and higher orders. So it's a question of energy flux density. So you have to move to these higher applications of man's thought and mind. And we build the social relations with that. And that's what the United States was originally set up. And we got to go back to those principles ourselves. So that's it. I was able to get in there.